Hi, this is Dan Hausman with the Novel Cohorts podcast, and I'm here with Juliana Kokella, and we're here to talk about uh, her new venture and, and talk about real world data. So Jules, um, tell me a little bit about your background. How'd you get involved in data science? How to get involved in healthcare? All right, hey Dan, hey guys. Um, so I'm Jules Kotakella, and my background originally was in mathematics and statistics. Um, but fast forward in my previous life, um, in a big four consulting group, um, I started what was called the Insight Studio. And what I really did is worked with, you know, hundreds of different companies to drive innovation and, and really using their data um, to identify, you know, what insights were possible, practical as well as feasible and valuable. Um, so I really kind of merged my skill sets coming from school when I was a kid um, up into kind of using it in a real world uh, manner. When I was working at the big four, you know, I traveled consistently and um, quite often. Uh, I, you know, I had these conversations with my daughters. I have two daughters and the oldest one who's not yet 13, she was having some challenges with school unbeknownst to myself. And the teacher called me up to have an intervention and I was like, what is this? Um, and it was basically that she was having a conflict with a girl in another classroom. And, you know, I was kind of like, where did this kind of come about? Where did it come from? I didn't really have, I kind of was blindsided with, I didn't have any awareness before that the situation was escalating and that it kind of came into its own. And I thought at the moment, if I had contextual awareness to understand that there was something that was going on, um, you know, where she was, it could really open up that aperture to have an honest discussion and dialogue with my daughter. And so that kind of started getting the wheels moving. And um, so I left actually a big four to start Cheeky. And that's how I started Cheeky. And it's really the, the culmination of all these different things, having that, that real poignant problem of my, in my own life um, and seeing how not only data science, but um, how untapped um, the mental um, health arena really is, right? There's no class two types of devices. And I really wanted to be able to not only just help myself, but help other people who could be in a similar type of situation. So, so I think it's a, it's a consumer device you're working on. Can you tell me more about what it is, what it looks like? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a smart wearable uh, ring. It's an integrated behavioral management system in a smart wearable ring. Um, the titanium ring contains a miniaturized sensor package, which is capable of detecting biophysiological signals in real time that is also paired with mobile application that allows um, the individuals for near constant monitoring as well as interventional treatment. So this actually gives us the ability to alert the patient preemptively, uh, alternately recommend um, different courses of action. And ultimately we look to align um, the individual's emotional goals with quantifiable therapeutic outcomes. So, you know, think about this in a different way we could potentially assist in treatment decisions um, by alerting clinicians to acute distress factors, right? Um, some different areas like that, that we have some ab abilities, as well as in addition to, you know, just-in-time interventions and retrospective analysis. So, so it sounds like a, a smart mood ring from the 70s. Is that right? <laughs> it's a smart mood ring from the 70s, but it is turbocharged. <laughs> So we've taken the best that technology has to date and put it into the, a very small form factor. And, you know, why a ring? Why not just use my Apple Watch or whatever Samsung does? Um, so the ring was a really great form factor um, requested actually by one of my founders, my co-founders. And um, I thought the idea was really great as well as, um, you know, a watch is very different. Um, a ring can be very stylish. And I felt that there was no real um, meeting the needs in the marketplace, right? When you think about what was out there, there's lots of fitness bands or, you know, watches and so forth, but there was high amount of saturation. Um, when you think about the different ring form factors, there's not very many that play in this space. And they're also for very different use cases. And, and you know, you're going to be observing a whole lot of things based on what you described. Aren't you worried about privacy and people being uh, concerned about the invasiveness of this kind of product? Yeah, completely. I mean, I think, I mean, we take privacy very, very seriously, right? With, um, you know, especially when, especially when you think about what are the concerns that people have. 
is definitely around privacy. And people have the option to share or not to share, right? We, we give people the, the tools and the capabilities to make a choice, right? An informed decision, whether they want to use the data for themselves or do they want to share it with other people, um, either be that from a clinical standpoint or with creation of their own tribe, right? Um, another thing when you think about people don't typically like ask for help um, if they really, really need it, right? You, you see a lot of this stuff happen and imagine if you could preemptively understand or see that maybe a friend, family member, cohort, et cetera, wasn't doing really well. What happens if you could interventionally, like actually intervene into that situation ahead of time? Instead of waiting for somebody to call you, you make the call. Yeah, but doesn't that get into that privacy problem? If there's someone no, else. But that's, but that's oh. the individual's choice, right? That's completely their choice. They don't have to share. They could keep it to themselves. That's okay. And, and, you know, how do you train this thing? You know, I think you're assuming it works out of the box. Does it get better over time? No, it gets better over time, right? You have to baseline for an individual because every person's completely different, right? So you have to go through the baselining process to really understand uh, where do you fall in terms of, um, you know, the different levels of emotional state. You know, happiness to you might be like, you know, very, what, what would be considered on my scale, like sad, right? So everybody falls into a different area. And so you have to be able to actually baseline. Um, and as you wear it, the more that you wear it, the more it's understanding and recognizes, um, you know, your own feelings, thoughts, emotions, using your, his, you know, your prior history, as well as as you're going through your day, and it just gets better. In addition to that, I mean, that's the whole purpose of really um, having the multi-phased effort with University of California, San Diego, right? We've already completed one clinical trial in um, India, right? But that's in a laboratory, you know, type of setting. It's not real world. Um, when, you know, you're in the real world, you're moving, there's different noises, there's all these different types of artifacts that you have to account for. You know, how will this work in conjunction with healthcare? So if you're dealing with a clinical team and a, a patient and patient data, like how's it gonna work? And then what kind well, of use do you thought of? I mean, so there's a, those are, I mean, they're pretty, pretty different use cases, right? I mean, there's definitely, it's a prescribable option, right? Where we're working directly with, you know, um, the doctors, the therapists, uh, the patient itself, right? Very separate use case versus um, the over-the-counter version of our product, right? Ultimately, our goal is to be class two device so we're working, you know, with the FDA to do and take the steps that are necessary um, to go through that process. Uh, and so, you know, validation is important. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're going to do that. Um, how do you validate something like this? Have you thought about it? Yeah. So the, the validation, you know, really comes from, you know, having that foundational data set, right? And so in our proposal, right, with the IRB for our clinical trial, it kind of goes through, um, you don't want to bias the different individuals, but you want to make sure. And so people are pinged throughout the study, right? It's a 12-week study um, with control group and so forth. And um, as we validate the algorithms, when there's specific movement relative to their heart rate, we send them an actual um, alert, kind of, you know, basically like, you know, can you open the app and ask, basically choose, you know, did you, did you feel something, is your mood changing, right? Um, from collecting all of that information, that's really going to be kind of like the base and the foundation for taking it out to market. And then, you know, if you could link this to claims data or things like that, do you think you could find patterns that would identify people with certain diseases or classify who's at risk for a negative outcome? Oh, or completely. Treatment? Completely. I mean, there's there's so many different things that you can start looking at, right? Especially with um, mental health and chronic care diseases and conditions. Um, they're very heavily and highly correlated. It's just I, understanding a lot of it is to deal with social determinants. And that's where I think we actually play really strong in is, is having that environmental stimuli, having the analysis of, you know, not only just who are you potentially engaging with, but where are you, what time is it, and kind of what are you doing? That contextual awareness really adds that flavor, which I think is really challenging for anybody to really understand, right? So, um, you know, or think about what are different social determinants for, you know, claims data for, for the different individual patients, right? How can you start kind of understanding 
where they're living, what are they doing, what's the demographics of the area. Sometimes not all that information might be available. Hopefully it would be, um, but it can definitely make it a lot richer to preemptively determine, um, you know, before a cause or before a condition kind of gets out of hand. And who's the most likely? What's the likelihood of need for intervention or that they'll potentially um, relapse into the uh, emergency department, emergency room? And um, I have seen a lot of these um, devices get used in clinical research, mm -hmm. just as a tool for patients who are already on a oncology trial or on a mm -hmm. schizophrenia trial. Yeah. Um, you know, how, how, how do you think that's going to work? You know, do you have to change the device or is it the same device or you know, what, what's it going to look like? Um, changing the device. So that's a good point, right? So it depends. when you think about your class two submission, it's for a very specific use case. Um, if you start monitoring for additional, what I'm thinking that you're asking for is if you're undergoing like so you're, um, another like trial and um, you want to know how they're feeling throughout the trial. So potentially like maybe the drugs that they might be under in, in a trial for might have lead to suicidal ideation, right? There's some things like that where you could incorporate additionally like the cheeky ring to understand some of those, those things. Because right now, what do people have, right? In the clinical trial, they, you know, use the GADs or, you know, the PHQ-9, um, but those are all point in time not continuously monitored. So I think that it would actually be a really big help to clinical trials, much more innovative to incorporate that, to ensure that um, the patient health and safety are of utmost importance. And, and, and I'm thinking you're gonna end up with some treasure trove of data here. You'll have, yeah. you know, let's say you're, you're super successful, a few years from now you have 10 million subscribers or 100 million subscribers. Yeah. What are you gonna do with all that data? It's a good question. I think that might be for podcast number two. <laughs> um, you know, maybe, you know, we can open it up for more research opportunities, right? Um, with UCSD right now, what we've been talking with them about is, um, you know, just like the NC, N3C um, opportunities out there, it's how do we make the world better for everybody, right? Without, without giving away people's, um, you know, privacy or, or individualized data, of course, but if we could aggregate that somehow to help or support mental illness, I think we'd, we'd definitely be in favor of that. Um, and you know, you're an entrepreneur, so you must stay awake late at night dreaming of what the future lies, you know, especially with your lens with Cheeky, you know, what are some things you see happening in the future that are really exciting? Um, I think it's the idea of almost like 24 hour um, constant remote monitoring, right? Um, I really love the idea that people can get and understand not only where they are, but determine where they wanna go. And I think that opens up a whole new world for most people. Most people can say, oh yeah, you know, I feel stressed or this or that, but it's not about kind of, you know, how you felt, it's how do you wanna feel? And um, I think it's about smashing that stigma. And if we can, you know, really be the leading brand of emotional wellness um, and mental health, in this area, uh, that to me would indicate definite success. Great, Jules. Well, well thanks for taking the time with me today. And uh, I guess we, we have to plan that podcast number two. <laughs> so we're talking about data. <laughs> right. Awesome. All right, thanks, Dan. All right, catch you later. <laughs>